I want to start this video by saying I can finally feel the pain of Europeans who have to watch a starship in the early hours of the morning. However, Flight 11 was spectacular, massively successful, and we had a lot of lasts, including the last of the V2 ships to fly, the last time that we would see a ship launch from Pad A or Pad 1, and the last time we're going to have a hot stage ring for Starship but also the first time that you may have noticed that I haven't streamed a Starship launch. Unfortunately, my internet connection in Austria wasn't super reliable, but it was amazing to watch it and just actually watch it for the first time instead of streaming and commentating. Plus, actually watching SpaceX's commentary, they revealed a lot of information yesterday that I wanted to wrap up some of the highlights for you guys. So during the pregame commentary for the launch, SpaceX unveiled an automated tile bakery and crunch wrap design for Starship reusability. We had heard about the crunch wrap design thanks to Bill Gerstenmeier's remarks at a recent conference, but we hadn't actually seen how this looked. And so we had a great demonstration of what that looks like. And, and we're getting ready to mass produce everything, including one of the really key contributors to that rapid reusability, the heat shield tiles. Let's jump over to Tyler real quick and Hawthorne, who's got a really cool look at what's happening with tiles in Florida. Thank you, Dan. Indeed, Starship's heat shield is the linchpin to full and rapid reusability. We can't launch, land, refuel, and launch again if we have to spend months refurbishing the heat shield after every launch, like they did in the space shuttle program. So in a future where Starship is flying several times a day, many, many thousands of heat shield tiles will be required. So yeah, we need to get cooking on those tiles, which is exactly what's happening inside the fully automated bakery down at the Cape. In just three years, tile production at the bakery has surpassed the total number of tiles produced during the 30 years of the shuttle program. To go from the raw material to a finished tile, it takes about 40 hours. And today, the bakery is producing about 1,000 tiles a day. But it's set up to produce enough tiles for 10 ships per month, which is about 7,000 tiles a day, or a tile off the line every 13 seconds. So yeah, the bakery is well on its way to providing Starship with all the tiles for missions to Mars and beyond. And for today's flight, we've made a modification to the heat shield tiles. Dan, do you mind filling us in on what's being referred to as the Crunchwrap tile? Absolutely, I always love to get to do a little show and tell. So we've got thousands of these heat shield tiles covering Starship. Now they're kind of all next to each other. There's a small gap in between all of them. You gotta leave a little bit of space as that metal underneath will expand and contract. That way they don't crunch into each other and start breaking. However, that lets some of that plasma kind of seep through and we see really high heating on the sides and then down on the metal. To help fix that, we have this, the crunch wrap that everyone has heard about. So we take essentially that's called Vulcan felt that we then wrap around. And so as these tiles are next to each other, you've got a small bit in between that's gonna help offset that heating. It's just one of the ways we're continuing to iterate on this heat shield, getting towards rapid reusability. Hopefully it's gonna help Starship live Moss. You know, everything is just gonna get us to that end state of a fully and rapidly reusable vehicle. So. Pretty much the entire vehicle has those on it today. We've done this on multiple Starships previously, but this time, pretty much the whole vehicle has it. Before we jump back into the video, I wanna thank today's sponsor, Delete Me. As someone who shares a lot of information online, I really value keeping certain parts of my life private, like my phone number and where I live. That's where Delete Me has been a total lifesaver. I've actually been using Delete Me for over a year and a half now, and it's wild how much of your personal data ends up online without you even realizing it. When I first searched my own name, I could literally find my address and phone number on public websites, and I know I'm not the only one. Data brokers collect and sell this kind of information every single day, which can lead to things like identity theft, spam calls, and even harassment. But the good news is you can fight back and that's exactly what Delete Me does for you. They handle all of those tedious opt-out requests and removals, and then they send you a detailed report showing exactly what they found and took down usually within a week. Plus, they keep scanning throughout the entire year so that your data stays gone. For example, they just delivered another scan report to me just about a week ago, and it says that they reviewed over 50 800 listings, saving me over 60 hours of searching and 35 hours of removing. It gives me so much peace of mind knowing that my private info isn't floating around on the internet anymore. 
And if you want that same sense of security, you can get 20% off of all U.S. consumer plans through my link at joindeleteme.com slash Space. So just use the code Alienspace at checkout. A huge thanks to Delete Me for helping me stay protected and for supporting my channel. Now let's talk about Flight 11, which had no drama, unlike many of the other V2 launches that we've seen in the past, except for Flight 10. Now, as I mentioned, this is the final flight of the second generation Starship or V2 Starship and the first generation Super Heavy Booster, as well as the final launch from the current configuration of Pad 1. Every major objective of the flight test was achieved, according to SpaceX, providing valuable data as they prepare the next generation of Starship and Super Heavy. So it was interesting, this launch was actually the first anniversary of the first ever booster catch, but on this launch, they decided not to catch the booster. So following stage separation, the super heavy booster completed its boost back burn to put it on a course to a pre-planned splashdown zone off the coast of Texas using 12 of the 13 planned engines. Under the same angle of attack tested on the previous flight, Flight 10, the booster descended until successfully igniting all 13 planned engines, including one that did not relight during the boost back burn for the high thrust portion of the landing burn. The booster successfully executed a unique landing burn planned for use on the next generation booster. Super Heavy hovered above the water before shutting down its engines and splashing down. And after completing a full duration ascent burn, Starship achieved its planned velocity and trajectory during flight. Starship successfully deployed eight Starlink simulators and executed the third in-space relight of a Raptor engine, demonstrating a critical capability for future deorbit burns. Starship re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and was able to gather extensive data on the performance of its heat shield as it was intentionally stressed to test the limits of the vehicle's capabilities. In the final minutes of flight, Starship performed a dynamic banking maneuver to mimic the trajectory that future missions returning to Starbase will fly. Starship then guided itself using its four flaps to the pre-planned splashdown zone in the Indian Ocean, successfully executing a landing flip, landing burn, and soft splashdown. Another fun moment of the live stream, which many of you caught, is that Elon Musk made a surprise cameo or photo bomb during the Starship live stream. What the? We're live. <laughs> What's up, guys? How's it going? Good hey. to see you, boss. Hi. Hey. How's work going? Good. We're live right now. What the? Yeah. <laughs> Getting ready for Flight 11. <laughs> How are you feeling for it? Good. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is the first time that I'm going to be actually outside standing and watching the rocket. Because normally I'm in mission control and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, now I'll be standing out in the garden there. Okay. Uh, so awesome. It's really going to be much more visceral. Yeah, yeah, you're going to feel Great it. Place it's going to be. It's going to be. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Uh, we'll be in here this time, but usually we're out there watching. Yeah. All right, sounds good. All good right, luck later. and have fun. Have fun. All right, so that was an exciting cameo there. And uh, it was overall just such a successful launch. The real questions now are, when will we see Flight 12? Because, of course, they're going to have to launch from Pad 2 or Pad B. And um, that will also be the next generation of Starship, the V3 ships, which, thanks to this video from Lab Padre, we got a sneak peek at what those are looking like. So my prediction is I think that it'll take a few months to get Pad 2 actually ready to launch and also have the V3 ships completely ready to go, but they have multiple vehicles in production right now, and it'll be pretty exciting. Elon Musk has stated in the past that they're thinking that they'll attempt the first catch of both the ship and the booster on flight 13. So if you are really aching to have another catch, uh, we'll see if they'll do a booster catch on flight 12, but flight 13, maybe when they attempt the first catch of the ship, which will be just insanity. Significant changes. This is building on everything we've learned from all of these flight tests to make a vehicle that we're looking to mass produce. Starting with the Starship upper stage, which is going to look pretty similar on the outside, but it's getting pretty much a complete overhaul under the hood. We're getting major design changes to its propulsion system that's going to accommodate that new version of Raptor, which puts out higher thrust. We're also getting an energy storage upgrades, tons of avionics changes, a lot of things that will enable longer duration missions. One notable thing you'll start seeing on the outside are these new docking adapters, which we'll use when we bring two Starships together for propellant transfer. That's a core capability of Starship that we're going to demonstrate next year. 
Bottom line, though, this is the Starship we're planning to use for all of our next major milestones, orbital missions, return to launch site and catch, reuse, propellant transfer, and then making our way to the moon and Mars. Now, super heavy. We've shown some of this off, some of this hardware already coming out of the factory. It has upgrades like this, a redesigned fuel transfer tube. That thing's roughly the same size as the first stage of a Falcon 9 rocket. That channels all that cryogenic fuel down to Super Heavy's 33 engines. We made it bigger. It's basically a rocket inside of our rocket that gives us a faster, more reliable flip and simultaneous engine startup. New booster also going to have an integrated hot stage, a lot more vent area, and it's designed to be fully reusable. Pressure from those engine plumes gets vented out, mostly offset just by the pressure in the fuel tank. That is the top of the fuel tank. And then we add a non-structural layer of steel on the top that helps take all the heating. It's mapped to where all the high heating goes. Grid fins also getting a big change going from four down to three. They're 50% larger though, much higher strength. They're also going to get used for vehicle lift and catch. That's all made possible. There's a new catch point addition on those grid fins. We've also kind of reclocked their position on the booster that aligns them with the catch arms. The, yeah, we got right in the middle there. All right, and then powering it all, Raptor 3. Looks radically different, just straight up radical. Tons of major changes. It's coming in higher thrust, dramatic reduction in parts. Tons of control mechanisms moved inside. Our McGregor teams built some additional stands like this one, which essentially is the bottom of a super heavy booster. Lets us do gimbal or steering tests. So that's been really exciting to see. We've also been getting vacuum versions of Raptor 3 into test. The first flight engines are already in production. Now, because this flight was uh, so successful and not a lot of drama, I would say that the wildest thing actually that I saw yesterday was unfortunately a fellow YouTuber, Felix Schlang with What About It, apparently had his channel uh, taken down. So I want to tell you a little bit about that. I've already had some comments on my channel of videos where I've interviewed him in the past asking what's going on, why can't I find his channel? So their current situation, he wrote on X, um, he says that what about it has been removed from YouTube. He wrote, someone out there wants us to go down. To that someone, I'd like to reply, you will not succeed, you will not win, and we will prevail stronger and more motivated than ever before to spread the word about spaceflight and the greatest transformation in human history. And so he shared a screenshot saying uh, from YouTube that his channel was removed for not following policy on harmful or dangerous content and that they removed it to protect the community, which just seems absolutely absurd to me. So I'm hoping that he is able to get that uh, up and running pretty soon. I had seen earlier in the day that apparently a couple minutes before the launch, uh, the live stream was taken down, and then, of course, this no one could have expected. So I just wanted to kind of update you guys. I know that you guys watch a lot of the other space creators, and this is just a really terrible thing to happen to him. So this just uh, was honestly the most shocking thing that I had seen. Um, and I really hope that YouTube is able to resolve it because this is a nightmare for any creator and completely baseless. Um, so I just wanted to let you guys know if you guys are looking for his channel, what seems to be going on. He posted about this on X and I know not everyone is on X. So thank you so much for watching this video. Sorry that I wasn't there in person or able to stream the launch, but uh, it was really kind of kind of nice to just be able to watch it and take in um, you know all of the excitement. It's also very exciting to see how routine Starship hopefully is becoming much like Falcon 9 and um, just some great stuff ahead for SpaceX and I'm really proud of SpaceX and all of the hard work that they're doing.